brother to one of the most famous pyromancers in Dranglick, we meet a tarnished who used to have the most beautiful voice in the lands between. Having trained under the winged dames of Leornia, this entertainer became very proficient at luring adventurers, tarnished or not, to an untimely demise. But while his brother dwelled in the flames, he became an arcanist. Unfortunately, when it comes to the eldritch arts, sometimes the price we pay is not the price we want, and he soon found his voice silenced. But a clown is a clown, and his madness pushes him to make all beings in the lands between happy, even if he has to carve the smile himself. Ladies and gentlemen, with you, Jester Timothy. This is an intelligence arcane build that focuses on having as many tricks up its sleeves as possible. Through the combination of some of the most powerful PvE weapons in the game with some key support sorceries, we obtain a character that can adapt to and solve every problem that the game throws at it. And with great style too. Single targets, multiple targets, close range, long range, aerial threats. This buffoon can make fools of them all. As always, we will review the stats of this build, the equipment that we use, and of course its applications within the game. Since there is a lot of ground to cover, I have created timestamps in the description of this video in order to make it easier to navigate the content and give you the opportunity to skip straight to the part that interests you the most. Let's get started. This is a PvE focused build that works well in both solo and jolly cooperation. The main objective of this build is to be able to use both Moonveil and Rivers of Blood to their maximum potential. These weapons have gathered a very negative opinion due to the large amount of players that choose to use them. The reality of the situation is that these two weapons are very good for PvE. In fact, they are so good that some would say that they eliminate all value from Elden Ring's PvE experience by making it too easy. While I do understand this sentiment, my opinion is simple. If it's in the game, use it freely. Combining both weapons in a single build gives us access to multiple damage types and two fantastic Ashes of War that work really well together because they cover each other's weaknesses. Besides this, the character has access to most sorceries in the game, allowing us to pick a handful of spells that perfectly support our character by providing it with answers to some of the situations that the katanas might be weak to. Not only this, but the stats of the build also gives it some other alternatives when it comes to armaments that really solidify it as a true master of diversification. To reach this objective, we will be running the following stats. Start the game as an Astrologer. This class is the most efficient to reach the required stat block for this build, allowing us to make use of every rune level possible to its maximum potential. As the primary focus of this build is PvE, I have chosen to base it on rune level 150. Finally, this is the stats block that you want to end up with. 60 Vigor, 26 Mind, 9 Endurance, 12 Strength, 18 Dexterity, 50 Intelligence, 7 Faith, and 47 Arcane, plus 3 from the Mask of Confidence for a total of 50. There are many ways to reach these stats. Level up however you feel comfortable. That said, I do recommend that you take the following path. As soon as you are in the lands between, the first thing to do is get your vigor to 20. Survivability is more important than damage when you're just starting out a character. The second priority will be to get strength to 12, dexterity to 18, and intelligence to 23. These are the requirements to use Moonveil, the carry weapon of the build. It is definitely recommended to get it as soon as possible. The third priority is to get Vigor to 40. This will allow you to survive comfortably throughout the mid-game, allowing you to focus on the other stats. The fourth priority is to get Intelligence to 30 and Mind to 26. This will increase the damage of Moonveil and give us plenty of FP to use its Ash of War, Transient Moonlight, often. This will be our main source of damage. The fifth priority is to get intelligence to 50. This will continue to increase the damage of Moonveil while also increasing the amount of spells that we can use. This should give us plenty of options to finish leveling up the character. The sixth priority is to top off Vigor at 60. This will put us at our required HP pool, granting you maximum security to withstand the hardest hitting attacks from the endgame enemies. The seventh and final priority is to bring Arcane to 47. 
This will turn the build into the final hybrid that we require. It will slowly open up more weapon possibilities and some final spell choices. We have treated this build as a standard mage so far, and it is now time to turn it into the Jester. Remember that we use the Mask of Confidence in this build, bringing the total arcane to 50. So, why do we want these final stats? Allow me to explain. Vigor at 60 because I believe it is the perfect amount of health to survive the hardest hitting attacks of PvE. This will give us a total of 1,900 base HP. It is the second cap for the stat. Going any higher really diminishes your returns. And honestly, I never go any lower. Mine at 26 because it is the highest amount that I could get after I min-maxed every other stat. The more FP we have, the more times we can use the Ashes of War from our weapons. And that generates damage. Endurance at 9 because it is the base level of the Astrologer. It is already enough for me to use the weapons and armors that I want and keep a medium load, so there is no need to level it any further. Strength at 12 because it is the minimum amount that we need to cover weapon requirements of all the armaments that we choose to use in this build. Dexterity at 18 because it is once again the minimum amount that we need to cover the weapon requirements of all of the armaments that we choose to use in this build. Intelligence at 50 because it is one of the primary stats of the build. It increases the damage of our spells and Ashes of War, as well as allows us to use multiple different spells that gives us more options to deal with multiple issues. Faith at 7 because it is the base level of the Astrologer. We do not need it at all in this build. Finally, Arcane at 50 because it is the other primary stat of the build. It increases our weapon scaling, our status effect application, and the damage that our spells and Ashes of War do. It is a very important offense-based stat for the character. Remember that this character has 47 Arcane, and we get an additional 3 points from the Mask of Confidence to reach the total of 50. Moving on to the equipment, this is the basic layout of the build. This character is a trickster type meaning that it can perform well in both melee and at range, thanks to the many different tools that it has access to. Multiple spells, Ashes of War, and weapon choices makes it very easy to pick the right answer to each and every problem that the game can present us. When it comes to armaments, the main focus of the build is to run the dual katana setup with Moonveil and Rivers of Blood. The objective is to have accessibility and adaptability through two of the most powerful PvE weapons in the game working together. Rivers of Blood covers fire damage and Moonveil covers magic damage. In this way, we are able to counterpick weaknesses and avoid resistances. For example, the fire damage from Rivers of Blood can be good to fight enemies that flinch and stagger when hit with this damage type. Overall, we want options. And speaking of options, we have access to both Ashes of War that these weapons offer. Corpse Piler from Rivers of Blood is our crowd control choice. It is able to hit multiple enemies, bleed them to cause a stagger, and even go through shields. And then, Transient Moonlight from Moonveil is our single target elimination tool. There are very few enemies that can withstand the might of this Ash of War and it combines both damage and stance-breaking capabilities. This will be our choice to deal with large enemies, or particularly difficult ones. When it comes to these two weapons, you can place them wherever you want in your equipment slots. Personally, I like to dual-wield them. For me, it is better to have Rivers of Blood in my main hand and Moonveil in my offhand. This way, I have access to Corpse Piler at all times in order to deal with multiple enemies. And, if I need to deal with a particularly troublesome one, I can two-hand Moonveil in order to take advantage of its Ash of War. This is, of course, a personal choice, and if you prefer Moonveil in your main hand, it is equally good. With this setup, I can take advantage of Power Stance attacks against enemies that are easily staggered, but I can also two-hand either Katana to fight sturdier enemies. As mentioned before, being able to jump back and forth between both Ashes of War is also extremely versatile. Understanding and mastering when to use each katana and when to use both of them together is a very important part of the build and it will generate most of the advantages that we can get from this setup. As for secondary weapons, I always have a mystery cord ready to pull out for maximum critical damage. 
In this build, I choose to run a Magic Misery Cord as it gives me the most damage possible. As for its Sash of War, I choose to run Kick. Some of the most troublesome enemies that this build can face are those with shields, and being able to kick them for an easy repost with the Misery Cord completely nullifies their advantage. Not only this, but we can also catch enemies off guard or punish big whiffs with a backstab in order to capitalize on damage opportunities and eliminate threats with very little effort. I never have this weapon out, but I always switch to it when the situation calls. It is extremely useful and can make very quick work of some of the most annoying issues that this character will face. The other secondary weapon that I run is the Alvinoric Staff. This is the strongest sorcery catalyst available to this build and it gives us the ability of adapting to all situations through the use of spells. When it comes to this character, I use sorceries as support and in order to fulfill specific objectives that the katanas fall short on. For example, getting rid of enemies at range, pulling enemies apart from their groups, increasing my damage or setting up obstacles that give this jester a tactical advantage. Spells can also be used to eliminate enemy advantages as well. The clearest example is using gravity sorceries in order to shut down aerial threats. All in all, I like to keep this staff in my secondary slots and have it accessible at all times in order to deal with any and all complications that the game can throw at me. As mentioned many times before, this character is about having as many tricks as possible and knowing how to use them. Magic is very advantageous to fulfill this objective. Now, this is the basic setup that I like to use, and it covers most of the situations that we will find in the game. That being said, there are other alternative armaments that this build can use in order to take advantage of other playstyles and tools. The first one that we can use is the Regalia of Aeocade. This is a straight sword that takes full advantage of our arcane investment in order to increase its damage. It has a really good and comfortable moveset and it pairs really well with a shield. This gives us access to a traditional sword and board playstyle that can counter certain particularly quick enemies like dogs or catacomb imps. Its Ash of War, Aeocade's Dancing Blade, gives us access to a really good single target tool that can deal with most strong enemies. You can even run a typical blender build if you choose to, adding to the versatility of the damage. Straight swords are some of the best weapons in the game, and it is never a bad idea to have one as a backup option. We mentioned the sword and board style, and in this case, if I had to run a shield with this build, I will use the Twin Bird Kite Shield. This is 100% a personal choice, and you can use any other shield that has a strength requirement of 12 or below. When running this build, I choose to go with a dual wield setup, but it is impossible to ignore just how much usefulness we get from a simple back pocket shield. There are enemies that are very quick and difficult to hit. With a shield, we are able to let these kinds of enemies bounce off our block and counter attack. You are not forced to keep the shield active at all times, but I will definitely recommend keeping it in your inventory for quick access, because sometimes Blocking is better than dodging. The final alternative armament that I like to use is the Wing of Astel. This is a really good weapon that can be used both in conjunction with a shield or dual wielding with another of its own type. The biggest advantage that this weapon provides is its own unique characteristics. First of all, the projectiles that we get from its R2s are extremely useful. It gives us the possibility to get some stance breaks from mid-range and it is very well suited to our heavy intelligence investment. As for its Ash of War, Nebula, it is extremely good. It provides a curtain that is very helpful to keep enemies away from the character. This not only protects us, but it also generates crowd control that gives us time to set up ranged R2s or spells. As mentioned before, it can also be used to a shield in a sword and board style. I was surprised at how effective this setup is. The counterattacks from Curve Source are very quick and have a really good hitbox. As a result, we can take advantage of the range and control that Wing of Astel provides alongside the safety that we can get from a shield. Overall, I have found a lot of success with this setup. The biggest strength that we have with this build is the capability to use all of these choices in order to perfectly adapt to every combat encounter that we may find. 
picking the right one, or the one that we like the most, is key, and the power we get from it is impossible to ignore. With our weapons out of the way, let's talk about talismans. This build has two objectives when it comes to talismans, survivability and damage. We want to have a lot of HP and defense to survive some hits, and we want to be able to put a lot of damage on the table. For this reason, we are running the Erdtree Favor plus 2 and the Crimson Amber Medallion plus 2 in order to get the HP values that we want. Then, the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman for increased defense and the Shard of Alexander in order to increase the damage that we get from our Ashes of War. Seeing as how our Ashes of War are some of the strongest techniques in the game, it is never a bad idea when they do additional damage. As a result, this build will have a total of 2,134 HP and a total of 30% physical damage absorption, which is considerable. Not only this, but we also get an additional 15% damage from any and all Ashes of War. This includes Corpse Piler, Transient Moonlight, Aokate's Dancing Blade, and Nebula. The result is obvious to see. We can take as much damage as we can deal. Alright, let's talk about armor. In this game, armor is extremely important. This is because this game has extremely good-looking armor. Fashion Souls, or Elden Bling, however you prefer to call it, is at an all-time high. For this build, I wanted to create a Jester. While we do not have access to the Jester set from Dark Souls 2, Elden Ring still provides us with really good armor pieces to achieve this look. What you see is the Mask of Confidence, the Altered Spellblade's Traveling Attire, the Leather Gloves, and the Eccentrics Breaches. This combination gives us a colorful look that is very reminiscent of a clown. On top of this, the Mask of Confidence with the sewn mouthpiece really plays into the backstory of the voiceless jester. I really like how it all comes together. All in all, this armor set gives us a total of 12% physical damage reduction that increases to 30% with the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman, alongside a total of 23 poise. On its own, it is not very strong, and we depend on the talisman to get any kind of useful absorption. And the poise is too low to be any useful, solidifying it as a PvE setup. That being said, we can't forget that the Mask of Confidence provides us with 3 points of arcane, and that is very useful. Overall, I prioritize the looks of the build over its defensive capabilities. When it comes to the Spirit Summon that we will use for this build, I decided that the best choice is Black Knife Teach. While it may come as a surprise that I am not using the Mimic, I honestly believe that Teach provides a higher tactical advantage to this build. While I was testing summons, I was positively surprised at how well Teach's Dark Blade attack synergizes with the different tools that this build takes advantage of. While the damage over time it deals is nice, I am mostly referring to the 10% max HP debuff that enemies receive. This debuff really adds to the amount of damage that we can put on the table. Whether it is through the use of Moonveil or by taking advantage of Bleed from Rivers of Blood, that 10% less HP that enemies have contributed a lot to saving time and making our attacks more efficient. This is particularly true when it comes to bosses. One of the most useful things about Teach is that the more HP that the enemy has, the more valuable she becomes. For this reason, I ended up choosing her over the Mimic when it came to this build. That being said, if you do prefer the Mimic, that is also a successful option. Besides this, Teach is also an extremely tanky summon. It is not so much that she has a lot of defense or HP, but that she barely gets hit. She is capable of dancing in and out of the enemy's range, dodging all attacks, and then moving back in to continue doing damage. Overall, I think that Teach is the second best summon in the game, and she shows exactly why, by providing perfect support to this build. Up to this point, we have spoken about the equipment and the armor. We have talked about offense and defense. Next. We need to talk about the different sorceries that this build uses in order to get the best value and benefit from our investment. Now, before we begin, it is important that you, my dear viewer, understand that spell choice is 100% personal. The list of spells that I will show you here is not the absolute best list that you can have. Instead, these are the spells that I prefer to use because they are the ones that suit my playstyle the most. 
you may think that other spells are better or that I am making the wrong choices. This is okay. Please remember to use any spell that you think is best or that provides you with the most fun. Moving on, I will show you my list of spells and do my best to explain the reasons why I think they are the most useful. Hopefully, you are able to obtain inspiration from when you are making your own list. Let's take a look. In this build, I only use 6 spells. Each sorcery has a use and they each shine as an answer to a specific problem. By focusing on these concrete options, I am able to quickly cycle between them for easier access. They are Terra Magica, Loretta's Great Bow, Oracle Bubbles, Great Oracular Bubble, Gravity Well, and Eternal Darkness. Easily, one of my favorite spells in this list and, in my opinion, one of the most useful ones, Terra Magica provides a steady 35% magic damage increase to all sources that originate inside its area of effect. This means that Terra Magica provides this boost to some of the most powerful tools of our build. They do not have to be spells necessarily. Weapon damage, as well as the damage from Ashes of War, will also receive this boost as long as they are magic type. Obviously, this has the single weakness that you have to stay within the area of effect in order to get the boost, but it is actually quite easy to set up. In this build, spells like Loretta's Great Bow, Oracle Bubbles, and Great Oracular Bubble can all receive big damage increase while being able to engage enemies from range. Let's not forget about Transient Moonlight. This Ash of War does magic damage and benefits from the 35% damage boost which will stack with the additional 15% damage from the Shard of Alexander, multiplicatively. Once everything is on the table, damage numbers can reach incredible amounts. Loretta's Great Bow is the spell with the largest range on this list. This is our sniping option, offering long range single target damage. This spell is one of those that I do not use often, but I'm always glad to have ready when the right circumstances occur. Capable of being charged in order to increase its damage, it is perfect for getting a surprise attack on the enemy. As a result, we get a tool that provides high burst damage potential at the longest ranges. If you are able to get the jump on the enemy, you will be able to use two or three of these back to back in order to guarantee the kill. It is also extremely useful to use as a pulling mechanism on groups of enemies. In this way, we are able to force difficult targets to fight us one on one and avoid dealing with multiples of them at once. This is of great strategic value, especially for this kind of build. We have great tools for dealing with groups of weaker enemies, and the build is great at one on one combat. But fighting more than one difficult enemy at a time can become troublesome. We have to avoid it. Oracle Bubbles is the first of two bubble spells that we use in this build, and it is a very important set piece for damage. On its own, the spell might not be very good, but it becomes extremely powerful when combined with other sorceries or techniques. The most efficient use for this spell is to create an obstacle that enemies run into when trying to attack you. For this reason, I like to set the bubbles on the map after pulling an enemy in order to force them to eat the damage as they chase me. If the setup works, then the enemy will be heavily weakened by the time they are in melee range. This is good not just because of the damage. In fact, I was very surprised when I saw how much stance damage these bubbles do. After an enemy is hit by these bubbles, it will be very easy to break their stance for a very powerful Mystery Chord critical attack. Of course, this won't work on every single enemy. For example, it's harder to use against flying creatures or enemies that have ranged attacks. That being said, if you know you are fighting a hyper-aggressive enemy that will rush you down, then you need to put these on the map to generate advantage. It is all a matter of knowing what you're up against. Great Oracular Bubble is the other bubble spell that we use, and much like the first one, it is also a very important set piece to generate advantage and damage. That being said, the setup is different. If the small bubbles are useful for defense while enemies are rushing you, then the big bubble is for offense, for when you are rushing the enemy. Indeed, this sorcery generates a slow-moving projectile that we can chase after, 
using it as an initial attack that is very easy to combo with. In this way, we can set up the Great Oracular Bubble, run after it and attack the enemy as they are initially getting hit by this bubble. We can combo into a Jumping Attack, into a Charge Star 2, into our Ashes of War or even into other spells. If you are able to initiate the attack, you will generate a lot of front-ended damage that will overwhelm your target. It is not only about actual HP reduction, but also about weakening their stance. Again, Chasing after this bubble can lead to multiple heavy hitting attacks that will very easily break the enemy's stance, giving you the opportunity of capitalizing with a very powerful Misericord critical attack. Overall, much like the tiny bubbles, this is probably not a spell that you will be casting over and over again. That being said, for the clever player and the trickster clown, it will lead to many different setups that increase your damage. Gravity Well is the number one answer to flying enemies. Generally speaking, flying enemies are annoying and specifically they are a big threat for this build. In order to neutralize this threat, we take advantage of Gravity Well. If we manage to hit a flying enemy with this spell, it will deal damage to the enemy, but most importantly, it will fling them to the ground, staggered, giving you a second to continue attacking them. This is the best way to deal with these kinds of enemies. The most important thing that this spell provides us is control, and it works to save us a lot of resources. Flying enemies are, generally speaking, agile, and they tend to move a lot. This forces us to spend resources or lose our positioning. Gravity Well nullifies all of this by locking the enemy down and leaving them wide open for quick elimination. Eternal Darkness is a spell that does not get used often, but that carries great value when it is needed. It single-handedly shuts down most incoming spells, giving you time to breathe and plan a counterattack. One of its best qualities is that while it absorbs enemy spells, it has no effect on yours. This means that you can set up to defend yourself while you use your own spells and Ashes of War in order to pick off enemies one by one. Personally speaking, I really like the spell, and I do not mind using a memory slot on it even if it does not see a lot of use. It makes things so much easier when facing spellcaster that it basically nullifies them. I like to have some good options to counter certain things, and mages are one of them. Trust me, things are a lot better when you are doing the shooting instead of being shot at. Every time I make a build, I like to make sure that I include a specific technique or strategy that we can take advantage of to increase the power of the character. In this case, we will be focusing on a simple animation cancel that uses the Moon Veil. This will let us use its Ash of War, Transient Moonlight faster by avoiding recovery frames. The result is a quicker DPS production that will overwhelm enemies and generate almost immediate stance breaks. Alluding to the character's movement and the weapon that we are using, I call the technique the Moonlight Waltz. Since the point of the technique is to take advantage of animation cancelling, then the first thing that we need to do is take a look at the animations. Here you are seeing four different cases. First, the basic animation without any cancels. This is the starting point to understand just how much of the animation we can actually get rid of. Then, you can see three examples of different animation cancels. We can cancel this animation by just holding L2, by rolling immediately after the attack, or by crouching immediately after the attack. The first observation that we can make is that we can cancel the animation earlier by rolling and crouching. Holding L2 to cancel is automatic, but it does come into effect a bit later. The second observation that we can make is that our character can immediately move after crouching, but when it comes to rolling, we have to wait until it is finished. The conclusion is obvious. The most efficient cancelling method is to use the crouch cancel. This is because it cancels the attack the earliest and it allows us to move on to the next action the quickest. The crouch cancel will be our choice. This means that the next step will be to understand the sequence of inputs that we need to execute this technique and the timings required to be efficient at it. 
In reality, this is not difficult, and the inputs are as follows. First, you're gonna hold L2 to ready the Ash of War stance. Then you're gonna use R1 or R2 to do one of the attacks. After that, you're going to crouch immediately and start all over again by holding L2 to ready the Ash of War stance again, use another R1 or R2 to do an attack, and then you crouch immediately again. You're going to repeat this as many times as needed. As you can see, the sequence is simple and can be easily executed. The important thing is to get the timing correctly in order to be able to execute each step of the technique as quickly and efficiently as possible. If you do it too soon, the next action will not come out, and if you do it too late, well, then you're just wasting speed. The perfect result will be to execute each step at the earliest moment possible, frame perfect in order to maximize the amount of animation frames that we cancel each time. This will lead to a higher number of attacks in a lesser amount of time. If you have enough FP, you can cycle this technique as many times as needed in order to defeat the enemy. It will take some practice to get it perfectly, but it is not hard at all. It is just a matter of getting a feeling for the timing. Once you get good at executing the technique, you're going to see a considerable difference in the speed of attacks. Obviously, if we compare the difference between doing the animation cancelling and not doing it, it would be huge. That is obvious. On the other hand, it is much more interesting to compare two types of animation cancelling. On the left, you will see a rotation of six attacks using the crouch cancel technique. On the right, you will see the same rotation of six attacks, but using the L2 cancel technique. Using L2 to cancel the animation is much easier. All you have to do is hold L2 and the game will do the rest for you. It is much simpler. In fact, it requires zero effort. But, as you can see, it is also much slower. Specifically, it is 2.5 seconds slower. Looking at it from the other perspective, using the crouch cancel technique will save you 2.5 seconds. This time that you save can be used to do one additional attack. This means that in the time it takes to do six attacks with the L2 cancel, you get a total of seven attacks with the crouch cancel. This extra attack can be anywhere between 1000 to 1500 additional damage on the enemy depending on your conditions, and it constitutes a considerable DPS increase. Lastly, I want to show you a quick clip of the technique in action against an actual enemy. This way, you can see just how efficient it can be. One of my favorite things about this build is that it gets better the more effort you put into it. Honestly, you can play this character by just spamming Corpse Piler and Transient Moonlight and you will have relative success. That being said, the true strength of this build comes out when you make an effort to execute the different combos that it offers and take advantage of all the different tools that it has available. Mixing in spells with Ashes of War, combining power stance attacks with two-handed variations, and counterpicking for each enemy weakness, all generate an incredible amount of value and makes this build truly strong. Not only this, but the build still offers decent defensive capabilities. A large HP pool with decent damage absorption provides us with the capability of surviving some of the strongest attacks that the endgame can offer. Overall, this build is extremely fun, and this jester does exactly what it is meant to do, entertain. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope I get to see you on the next one.